up in the chat. It's our first, our first matchup of the day of this brand new season of the China Team Championship. We had a great previous season. It was awesome. We had a lot of fun. Excited to see what's going to happen. As in the bottom. Okay, you know what? What are you, you going to say bottom? We'll do the bottom in the bottom right hand side. I swear down, it's because these minerals down here make it look like the bottom left, right? In the bottom right hand side, our blue Zerg player is Scarlet. Starting up on Disco Bloodbath Ellie. One of our brand new ladder maps for this current season of StarCraft 2's ladder. Scarlet with a pretty up and down season one of the China Team Championship. When we talk about her in season one, she was absolutely one of the players that was kind of needed to kind of do well for her team and she did she did kind of a she she did pretty well 10-4 in matches she had to play every week 71% win rate it's not bad it was it was a pretty good effort from Scarlet unfortunately it wasn't enough to see them through into the into the playoffs it wasn't enough to see them through into sorry it saw them through into the playoffs but in the playoffs Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to kind of get them further on. She only took one map off of Impact, and that was about it. So, yeah, Impact was a monster on that weekend. So was Patience. In the top left-hand side, our Red Zerg player, the Chinese representative or Chinese Taiwanese representative from Jin Air Green Wings. Every team must, must send out at least one Chinese player each week. He didn't win a map in Season 1. 0 and 10 as he played every week, basically. Uh, it was a bit of a shame, but... Let's see what he's going to bring to the table this season. It's Rex in the top left-hand side. Absolutely the weakest link of Jin Air Green Rings, and that's not just being harsh, that's not being nasty. That's just straight-up facts as to where we are at right now for Rex. He, you know, he's absolutely the weakest link. He's absolutely the player who is, you know, let, let not really let the team down because they did well enough anyways. They qualified for the playoffs before they actually couldn't manage to go because they didn't get visas. So... Hoping that Rex is able to, um, hoping that Rex is able to just get some map wins this season because he has to go out every week. It just feels like he never really got an easy break last season, right? He never really matched up against other Chinese players. He was always matching top Koreans, and yeah, I mean, maybe he should have delivered there as well, but it wasn't like it was an easy job for him. He's absolutely one of the underdog players that we'll see regularly throughout this season. So a couple of Zerglings from Rex going to start heading down to the bottom right-hand side. As we are just going to be running down to the bottom right, seeing what's going on. Is the ace match best of one, and how many points does an ace match win give? The ace match is just a best of one. And how many points does it give? Uh, I, in terms of what? In terms of the prediction contest, there's no positive or negative to an ace match win. It's just if you predict an ace match... They basically, you can predict an ace match when you predict the initial score, right? Um, so in that regard, that in that, I don't actually know what the rules are for the regular for the season, uh, which is, probably sounds pretty stupid, but I just haven't double checked on them yet. But I would imagine that it's going to be very similar to the last season, where actually winning an ace match, yeah. So matches are played in all kill format. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, regular match seasons are played in three best of two sets there's three points for a non-ace win and two for an ace win for the teams in the season so i'm sorry music i didn't know what exactly you were asking for i'm gonna try and answer all the questions right this series has been very passive for the first four minutes ago what's up the falcon coming in with the 100 bits thank you so much much appreciated yeah this is um it's gonna be interesting startup i mean we already see skull going into aspire Four minutes into the game, super early Spire off of a very fast lair, and look at that scout from Rex straight in, sees the Spire as well. Well, if I'm Rex right now, I'm looking at this, I'm saying, well, I know Mutalists are coming up, but I know there can't be that many. I would absolutely go into Queen production. I'd absolutely get a Nidus down and just try and go and bust Scarlet, because Scarlet is playing a very, very fragile, very greedy game, where an attack with a few Queens to take down, what well, can't be that many Mutalists because it's so early in the game. It's got to be vulnerable to a Nidus network. I mean, there's extra queens starting up. That's a given. Will we see the Nidus, though? That is going to be the real question, I think. Because, again, he's set up to Roaches. He'll have plus one on the Roaches, too, so he'll be able to two-shot Zerglings. Those are all the good things about the kind of setup he's got right now. And, again, it's perfect for really dealing damage to Scarlet here, perhaps. 
The only problem would be making sure you get the Nidus up. Six Mutalists now on the way out. Seen a few things moving around in the center here as the three drones going down across the map, so a couple of banes connecting. And we are going to be seeing the mutilus continuing to fly around. A couple of extra queens on the way up. And we do see again more lings coming down to the bottom side. Again, the lings of Scarlet looking to see what else is going on here. They're going to be able to nibble up a few of those lings, mutilisks from Scarlet into the main base. And well, they're going to be able to grab a few of these drones. So, two, three drones already going down. So Mutal starting to deal some damage again. There's a good amount of queens. The Spore Crawler defense is coming up. And Scarlet's going to commit into Mutalists. Going into the plus one flyer attack and going into even more Mutalist production. She is absolutely looking to... Uh, she is absolutely looking to try and... Well, just win out on Mutalists almost. I mean, there's no Rotoran in sight. There is, you know, no sign of moving away from this. I mean, again, the plus one flyer attacks. She's going all out in the sky as well. For Rex, this is absolutely the moment where if you go, you know, you see more and more Mutalists coming up, you'd make a tech switch. And with the way that Scarlet's playing, one of the more powerful ways to play rather than going into Hydras to fight those Mutalists is perhaps even Infestors. You play a very slow game, but the Infestor Fungal Groves are also very good when it comes to dealing with the Ling Bane on the ground. Whereas the Hydras, you know, that's what the Baneling speed is for. The Banelings are looking to buzz through a Hydra line, take down enough of the anti s so the Mutalists can then overwhelm in the engagements. So I would love to see the Infestors as the choice, and there it is. Infestation Pit dropping down from Rex. It absolutely makes sense. The Infestors... When there's going to be this many meters, when there's going to be Ling Bane on the ground, the Fungal Groves are just so valuable in that scenario as the meters fly in. Extractor will be taking a bit of damage, and yeah, Rex is going to take some more hits, sure. I mean, he's kind of meant to take damage to the, you know, from this at the moment, because that's a hell of a lot of Mutalus. It would be kind of weird if he wasn't. Let's see how well he does getting up into them Infestors, though. The Infestation Pit is done, currently struggling a bit on gas. Obviously, that's one of the nice uh, things about picking this gas off here from Scarlet. You shut down that income to, from Rex, and... You know, that's got a real kind of negative twang to it a little bit, so... That is a little bit tough. There's two Mutalisks, three Mutalisks chasing this Overseer down the bottom side, so Overseer will fall. So Overseer goes down. Hydra's Den is going to be continuing up Hive on its way as well in the main base, setting that up, and... Wow, okay, so this isn't actually quite what I thought it was going to be. It's actually going to be a Hive with a Hydralisk Den. Huh. I mean, do you go into Lurkers here as Rex? I'm just trying to understand what the plan may be. Because at the moment, it feels like Rex is a little bit susceptible to, well, a bit of anything, really. Scott's going to go diving around this right-hand side. The Queens at least do have, uh, you know, the creep to get over here a little bit faster with. He is just going to go dive bomb straight into the first four call. The Roaches in the front surrounded. Here come the reinforcements. And this goal comes this away. Four drones down. It is the Lurker Den from Rex. So trying to get up into Lurkers... I mean, it really, really is a bit scary, though, because now there is no real way to deal with the Mutalists. Not even getting Hydra upgrades, so it's not like we're suddenly going to have Hydralisks showing up and starting to fight these Mutas either. It's completely down to the Queens, and I do feel like that is a little bit scary as the Mutas continue to fly forwards here. The queens continue to try and get a bit more done. Link surrounding those Queens, and they will go down. And this is what I mean. Queens alone against this many Mutalisks just don't cut it. To game number two. In the top left-hand side, our blue Zerg player, who lost the first map for his team. This is Rex Scarlet. Looking good in the first game, in the red in the bottom right. I feel like his strategy was seen, was figured out, and Rex just didn't really respond correctly. Like I said, I would have loved to see Infestors there. I feel like it's one of those stars, you know, scenarios where maybe you need to keep on building Queens. You know, if you, if you want to cut Queens like that, then you kind of have to go into faster Hydras. You need something to be able to deal with the fact that, you know, Scarlet is literally going to keep making Mutalist. She is getting that plus one missile upgrade, and she is just going into more and more and more units. So you need to kind of be a little bit on top of that, honestly, as uh, Rex. And I mean, he, it's just a shame, right? Because he had the scout. He knew what was happening. He had really good reads on the game so far, and it just all fell apart towards the end there, and as unfortunate as that may be. Overlord rocking on up to the top left-hand side. We do see the couple of overlords of Rex heading down to the bottom. 
And players just crossing the map. Hatches, casts, spawning pools all at the same time so far. No difference between the two here on Thunderbird in our second map of the day. Now these series, these best of sevens, are made up of three best of two. So each player comes out, plays two games against the other player. And then players will swap. So every two maps players swap here. Our second set of players today comes up after this series for games three and four. We have Deer versus Trap. And then I, I think for games five and six are very exciting too. Time versus Cure. I mean, Time is a very good player right now. Has really been rocking it in recent events. It'll be very interesting to see how he does against Terran God Cure. I mean, Deer Trap, yes, a bit of PvP, but alas, I mean, we can't help them in matchups when they pop up. But honestly, I mean, we don't see a lot of Deer nowadays either. He doesn't play in a lot of online events or so. Uh, but Trap seems to be obviously still doing pretty darn well. GSL runner-up didn't do badly in GSL versus the world. So, uh, you know, only, you know, when you fall to King Serral, can you really call it a disappointing result? Or is it just the way the universe is meant to be, right? You know, Trap had a good run in GSL versus the world, and he gave Serral a good fight for his money in that PvZ as well. So, yeah, very awesome stuff as we continue to set up into this game number two. Again, very passive early game ZVZ. The both of them are going to take the third hatchery already. I mean, this is a pretty typical way to set up when you're going to go into that Baneling Nest as well and just come towards kind of the Ling Bane setup initially. And Thunderbird is just the one ramp defense, and so you could maybe argue the possibility of playing, you know, no Bane Nest and into Roaches. It's not like you're going to wall off this ramp very easily, though. So, yeah, it's... I don't know, it, it's a tough one, because if you go without the Baneling Nest and your opponent does go Ling Bane Aggression... Yes, you've got a bit of a defender's advantage, but it's still not easy. It's still not easy, as we're going to be seeing the Roach and dropping down there from Scarlet. So, she is going to bypass that Baneland Nest. Let's see how she does it then. Especially because Rex is going into that Bane Nest. So, I guess the question becomes, is Rex going to get aggressive? Or is he just going to make a handful of lings and maybe just say, okay, well, if you're not attacking me, I'm happy not to attack you. In which case, you know, Scarlet's gained 50 gas along the way, basically, because she hasn't invested into a banal nest that wasn't needed at all. Rex gets a full scout, though, so again, Rex gets perfect information in the early game, gets to see the Rotron, gets to see no banal nest. Okay, and he's just going to decide to drone and drone hard. The good thing about this is, while he did invest in the banal nest, he scouted well enough to know he doesn't need a couple of banelings morphed in. So that's one way in which he can just save that little bit of extra gas. And you can just see the gas difference, right? Because Rex got this 50 gas into the Bane Nest. His Lair's that bit later. His plus one missiles is that bit later. So Scarlet's Greed paying off a little bit, but they're not massive advantages to the point of this should, you know, completely change the game. Scarlet is actually up on extra gas already as well. So Rex is just playing a little bit slow on the gas income too. And that's why Scarlet can afford a new precise Carapace upgrade, get that Overlord speed working, and go from there. Zerglings of Scarlet down to the bottom side. Rex coming along as well. He's going to be chasing up in towards that base, but then pulls back just a little shy of it. Just coming down. Yeah, good good defense at the front initially. I mean, there's a few roaches out. You don't need a lot right here just yet. You just need a little bit to kind of get you by for the moment. So, so far, so good. Roach speed. Starts up again on that roach run. I say again, starts up on that roach run. We'll see it start up soon from Rex as well. Again, Scarlet has them slight seconds advantage. And again, that, that does add up a little bit. You know, little things can have a big impact in mirror matchups, but it's going to be, you know, the thing about roach speed and its advantage that it gives you is roach speed really gives you this advantage where it's like, oh my god, you can chase down units that much faster, you can attack that much faster. From a defender's point of view, there is, as long as you're playing defensively, there's not a huge disadvantage to not having Roach Speed. Now, yes, of course, you can maybe be a bit out of position. You can maybe have a tough time running between bases. But on a map like Thunderbird, where you're going to park your army and defend all your bases at once, you know, it's too early in the game for Burrow's upgrades to be in play and stuff like that. So for a map like this, the difference in Roach Speed doesn't matter at all. It just means Rex can't get aggressive until he has that Roach Speed, which, you know, isn't necessarily something that he's really been looking to do anyways. I'd imagine as soon as this plus one missile finishes, we'll see straight plus two missiles starting up. He goes into the infestation pit as well, so eyes on that to see what the plan may be. Because, you know, to already be taken away from the roaches is interesting. I mean, an infestation pit, a fast hive doesn't usually do a lot in ZVZ. You know, it's too early for really wanting to get up usually into vipers and so on. 
So I'm kind of intrigued what the plan is. That hive starts and Scarlet sees it too. There's obviously a scout is absolutely at a brilliant time. And she'll set up a roach drop over from the right hand side. Looking to stop, you know, dealing some little bits and pieces of damage. And it is definitely Scarlet still taking the initiative in what's happening in this game. Her Spire finished and she'll start up Mutalus too, which means she can clean up some of the map control. Overlords will start dropping down. And that will definitely be a bit of a problem as we see the roaches dropping in the main. And let's see what Rex's defense will look like, as at the moment, well, he's seen it, and he is starting to respond. The roaches from Scholar took a little while to wander forwards, and we'll find one drone so far, make that not quite two, as it jumps into the extractor again. And again, Roach has shown up, she'll get a second drone kill, and then just lift up into the overlord and back out of there. But the middle is taking position on the map, we now see a Nidus network dropping down too, so Scarlet's absolutely looking to play this aggressively. She's looking to kind of be all over the place, she's looking to overwhelm, She's looking to take advantage of Rex maybe teching up a bit too high. We've got to remember that usually in the world of ZBZ, if you tech past Roaches, you have a bit of a vulnerable little spot. And especially with the way that Rex is doing this, he hasn't got even got like something like Middleist already on the map or coming out on the map like Scarlet does. He just has a Hive tech upgrade that's not going to do much at all. Scarlet hits the Contaminate on the plus two missiles as well, slowing that upgrade down. And while she doesn't have her own plus two yet, it will be coming in faster than Rex's. As now we see Roaches dropping down. This is nice because the Roaches can defend the Nidus network initially too. Nidus will come up in the main as Scarlet still poking at the front, not really looking to commit in. Not until more units have been sent to go and deal with this. But Rex has sent a good amount of units across already. And it looks as though Rex should be able to start taking this fight. However, remember, Scarlet will have the plus two upgrade shortly. So that's still coming into play. Scarlet now makes a dive onto this Roach Ravager force. A couple of throws of powers didn't do much. The Queens will join up as well. They'll be able to come in and try and help push back those Mutalists. And it looks as though Rex initially was doing well, but then suddenly on the bottom side of the screen, these massive Roaches just showed up and Scarlet will begin running through. Crazy, more Roaches just showing up. A couple of Roaches and Ravagers still coming in as well. As we see, the Nidus network is on the way down, continuing to come on out. So Nidus is going to pop up in a few moments' time in the main base. You still see, again, a lot of Roaches over here. Going to be continuing to fight their way through Roaches and Ravagers. The Mutalus in the sky targeting down Ravagers as well. So a lot more being done as these Roaches continue to press forwards. Again, a lot of Roaches just getting surrounded up at the moment. And that is going to be just a little bit more continuing to go down as the Mutalus will continue to pick off Overlord after Overlord. Scarlet with a bit too much here. Yeah, I mean, still trying now. Just the main is just keeping a good amount of roaches put, you know, pulled back from Rex. So he can't fight with his whole army at once. And now that Rex has finally started to you know, get the upgrades and play like plus two, the fights are finally even. He just doesn't have the army supply to fight. He knows it. GG's out. Scarlet takes game two. Picks up the first two maps for Newbie. In the bottom right hand side, our blue Protoss player, it is Deer. Taking on. The red Protoss player trap in the top left hand side. Like I said guys, if you want to play some predictions, you are more than welcome to enter for, again, like I'll say the next two or three minutes, basically until this game is just about over, or thereabouts. Obviously at that point it becomes a little bit cheeky, don't want people editing results and stuff, or making, you know, don't want people, I mean we already know the first series, but whatever, I just want you some more people to play the prediction game, so exclamation mark predictions in the chat if you want to find out how to play, and again there are prizes to one. Stargate on the left hand side here from Trap getting ready to roll as we do have the probe from Trap on the bottom side of the map. So Trap's probe going on a little bit of a wander around on the south here coming across. We are going to see it uh, passing by the probe of Deer so in a way I mean this is obviously a bit funky. Deer's like where's that probe come from but it could also just be Trap scouting around. It looks like Dio is probably going to be scouting up here anyways. We'll see if he continues to find the hidden Stargate that is positioned now over on the left hand side. So Stargate being chrono boosted out. Phoenix about halfway done as the first Oracle of Dio is on the way. He's also hidden a Stargate out on the map too. It's kind of funny because neither of these guys have ended up scouting the other player. So for all of this hiding of the Stargate, etc., nothing's really going to come of it. But look at Trap. He's building Phoenix. And that's going to be a hard counter to the Oracle play of Dia. At least it should be. Dia's even making a shield battery as well. It's actually coming in at the front, and that's not really necessary. Oh man, this is going to be awesome for Trap. He's going to have Phoenix. He's going to be able to shut down the Oracle. And then he's going to have you know Phoenix to continue harassing with from there as well. Can definitely make some aggressive attacks happen with the Phoenix too. I mean, Phoenix are absolutely this unit that can 
deal a little bit of bonus damage here or there. As we are going to see, rope getting picked off, rope of facility coming up in the main base. Already dropping down, shield battery is coming in as well. Just blocking off that front entrance. But do you see the two oracles together coming across? Man, these Phoenix being kept at home. Well, actually, the Phoenix gonna fly out to the right hand side. This Nexus won't see the oracles. Oh, the Phoenix are out of position, so the two oracles will likely get some damage done. Our uh, trap sees it and pulls away instantly. And we'll see probes do start to go uh, down. Gonna have game hard enabled, but 9, 10 workers killed. That's 11 and 12 before it's done. So Deard gets some really good damage done initially. The Phoenix, just a little slow to clean up those oracles, and obviously not you know being out of position initially kind of hurts. Now Deer is up 14 workers. Well, the Phoenix will maybe do some damage, but they're not going to get 14 workers. They don't even have the energy to lift up 14 workers. Moving across the map, is there some potential of a lift and to deal some damage here? I'm not sure how much this. Phoenix production of Deer is going to help. He's going to be down a Phoenix, although you will catch up on Phoenix if Trap decides to stop building them now. Absolutely looking for a fight here. He's going to lift up. That's going to actually lower the Phoenix count down to even numbers, though. Making the Phoenix joining in the fight. A couple of shots go off. Probes pulled in. The probes really make a big difference here. Not sure where those adepts are off to. Looking for some information, perhaps. Trap playing from behind in the economy, and Deer takes a very early advantage, and if Deer wins this, Nubia are going to look to be on 3-0, and then, you know, Trap and Cure are basically going to have to win every one of their remaining games. Otherwise, Jinna are going to be defeated in the very first match of Season 2 of the China Team Championship. So, that's what's uh, going on here at the moment. We're going to be seeing the Phoenix coming in on each side of the mat. We're going to be seeing a couple Stalkers wandering forwards. So, a few Stalkers, Phoenix... Looking to see what's going to be happening. Again, Probe coming around the top side. Just again, scouting around a little bit. Stargate dropping down from Deer in the main base. Again, that's Stargate up and rolling. Again, Deer coming over. Takes the Watchtower on the top right-hand side. Let's have a Probe seeing what's up as the Phoenix gather up together. And again, this is the problem now for Trap, right, Deer? Kept an economy advantage. He didn't lose Phoenix. He started building Phoenix pretty quickly, too. And because of that from now, I mean, we're seeing, you know, him in the Phoenix advantage. And he's not going to give up that Phoenix advantage. An extra star, get a fleet beacon dropping down. Trap is almost already given up on Phoenix play. He's adding on two more gateways rather than extra stargates. So, it's going to be tough, though. Let's get this going. Stalkers from Deer coming down the bottom right-hand side. A couple of shield batteries will drop down. Phoenix flying around as well. Shield Valley is just absolutely making sure you can hold on in a fight here. Because Dia knows for a fact how far ahead he is after this early damage done. And six Shield Batteries, I mean, that's how much he knows. He just wants to make sure he wins this game, closes it out. Again, this could be huge for Newbie as we're going to be seeing the Phoenix pressing forward. He's actually going to find the Phoenix a trap. And, well, there goes one Phoenix right away. It's two for one already. He's going to fly over the store because he doesn't care. Taking down the Phoenix obviously goes so much better and so much faster here for Dia. And he will trade out wonderfully and still has the Phoenix count to the point where... You can actually just lift up these stalkers pretty much all at once. So Deer is going to win this fight. There's no real way to make this exciting, I don't think. Two more stalkers warping in. It's just so many Phoenix, and they're going to maybe just go for the warp prism as well. Absolutely a possibility. But honestly, they get, like I said, they could just lift up each of these units. And, you know, you don't even have to lift them all at once. Just lift them up one at a time. The stalkers aren't going to clean up the Phoenix that quickly. Trap's going to throw down a Dark Shrine, so really looking for any way to maybe get back in this game. The Dark Templars obviously could do very well here. But on the other side of things, you see a robo facility from Dia. So Dia is going to know, hey, you know, one of the ways I could lose right now, I don't really have detection. So I'm going to get myself a uh, robo facility up and running and kind of go from there because then at least I'll have the, you know, ability to go into observers, etc. Which obviously would be pretty nice if you see these Phoenix coming in. That's a whole bunch of probes starting to go down. So a lot of worker damage being done at the start. Again, these Phoenix now from Deer flying around. Going to start moving around down on the bottom side. Dark Shrine coming up to being about halfway done. And again, just the Phoenix seeing where they can go. So Phoenix coming back up to the top. And sending one Phoenix home. Looks like, yeah, the War Prism also going 
attack that. Well, I mean, Trap is just losing the entire mineral line again, right? What's the Warp Prism going to do at home? You know, if it picks off a mineral line, it's not even going to even out this game. Deer is in an amazing spot. And you can't really say too much else about it, right? I mean, Deer's doing what you should do. He's taking up a little bit beyond the initial kind of, you know, Phoenix. He's moving into a bit of a better composition now. He has an Observer. It is in the army, so it is near the main base. We have four DTs ready to run into the main. He might, if there's only one Observer out, if he goes for DTs into the third base at the same time, that could be problematic. And then maybe there's some potential for dealing damage to bases or so. I, I really don't know. There is an Observer here, though, for Trap. You know what? Okay, here's the play. With this Observer, you snipe down the Observer of your opponent. And well, if you can snipe down, you can see how important Dian knows this is already pulling it back. Yeah, if you can snipe that down, maybe you can empower the Robo, kill the Robo off. But even then, there's obviously a Stargate in play, and I won't see. I mean, the Observer goes into the main base. These CTs are absolutely in trouble. The Stalkers are going to run forwards as well now. The Observer is here from Dia. He's going to go after the Robo. Ah, but he didn't get the Observer, which is to the left-hand side, and now there's two Observers out for Dia, so Dia absolutely has the defense that he needs. Dia did everything he needed. Okay, so game number four of the series, and in the top left-hand side, representing Newbie, we have our red Protoss player, Dia. Up against the blue Protoss in the bottom right-hand side, Trap. So, game for the PvP, getting this ready to roll. As we set this up, get this going on Acropolis. So it's going to be seeing the probe coming down into the main base, having a little bit of a look to see what's going to be happening. Cybercore going to be finishing up on each side of the map. So Cybercore is going to be finishing up. And as the Cybercore is finished, we'll see Stalker Sentry on the way. And just going to be seeing the Warp Gate coming down as well. So Warp Gate getting going at the moment here. Again, the Proba Trap going to nibble away at the Proba Deer, which is just scouting into the main base. So a little bit of scouting going on at the moment as we uh, do see the pylon dropping down the shield battery just to wall the probe in. So probe is going to be stuck here. The Stalker and a Sentry made so Sentry actually pops out on one side. That's actually kind of risky. If there was a depth or so, their Sentry might be in some trouble. Actually, I guess it's his own pylon, right? So he's just going to be able to cancel it. And he kills off the probe with a single Stalker, so all is good in the end. And as we are going to be seeing the Stargate dropping down from Deer in the main base. So again, that Stargate up and running. Nexus dropping down as well from Deer in the natural. So a lot of build up here at the moment. A lot of getting ready to go as we are going to be seeing the Stalker and the Sentry coming over. And Nexus going to be dropping down on each natural expansion. So yeah, setting this up and seeing what happens next as Hallucinated Phoenix going to fly by. Each other in the center of the map. Stalker and the sentry going to be going after the hallucinated phoenix as well. And just going to be seeing the continuation of this here at the moment. So do you see the oracle on the way out from deer in the main base? Again, that up and rolling. And the units gathering up from trap. It's going to be nibbling their way through those unbuildable bricks on the low ground. Probes continuing to mine. And again, just going to be seeing the two gateways morphing into warp gates right now. Stargate finishes up, starts up an oracle. And it's going to be heading across over to the right side of the map. So it's coming over to the right. More stalkers on the way out as well. Twilight Council going to be finishing up in just a few moments' time. Just continue to set up into this. So. Two more stalkers from Dia. Walking in. I'm just going to see the Oracle going to be turned away. So Oracle turned back. Pushed away from the front. Meanwhile, Blink does start as the tech trace of Dia. Yeah, not bad from the Oracle. Getting a few kills right from the get-go. The Hallucinated Phoenix will be given again full information. Gets to see the Blink. So Trap in the know about what's going on this time around. Is going to continue making phoenix at the moment so second phoenix on the way up obviously the phoenix initially will get rid of that oracle guaranteed 
And then if you get a few of these, obviously they can get some further damage done as well. It's intrigued to say how many of them he wants to build, of course, because that's a pretty good initial question, you know, how many of these do you end up committing into, etc. Revelation comes down. Phoenix will be able to pick an oracle off. Launch dropping down on each side of the map, but it's again just Deer who feels to be a bit more kind of upgrade heavy at the moment. Going to be seeing the Twilight Council blink halfway done, plus one attack on the way now as well in the forge. So that continues up as the observer. Still coming out from trap here. He's only just got that robo up, and against these stalkers, obviously immortals are going to be very important, so he needs to make sure he gets that immortal count rolling, because that's going to be one of the real things that helps him hold on if these blink stalkers get aggressive at all. And it's going to be one of his advantages that he will have, the fact he'll have faster immortal production, while Dia has the better stalkers in the game. And as the trap goes into a twilight cancel of his own, charge should be the plan for him. Set up into a mid game that allows him to just go into that very traditional immortal arc on charge lot composition and go from there. Four more gateways in the main base here from Dia, so getting those ready to roll. And plus one attack on the forge from Dia on the way up. Templar archives dropping down in the main base too. Still probes going down, these Phoenix making a pretty decent job of this and actually able to get out alive the two sets of stalkers that blinked after. But we're only able to target down two different Phoenix, so no kind of continuation in terms of targets there. It means that the Phoenix will continue to fly around while well, looking pretty good. Templar Archives halfway done. And the Stalkers of Deer just continuing out into the center depths. It's going to get blinked on. Both will go down again. The Hoodersnade Phoenix coming out over to the left hand side. As we see more Phoenix in the main base picking up another couple of probes here so far. And the Templar Archives just about halfway done at the moment. Charge on the way up, plus one attack on the way up. Phoenix going to be able to lift up a sentry and that is going to go down as well. So sentry will fall here and still is uh, sentry nipping away at some other phoenix as well. A couple of archons finishing up, robot facility dropping down on third base. In the moment, the game will just continue as Stalker's moving down to the bottom. Zard Stalker's sentries and Immortals going to set up. Try and defend the right side. Immortals getting the first shot. Stalker's pushed back. Defense on the high ground. Good so far. far. Four more High Templar. Morphing in on the third base as well. They're going to be able to morph into Archons here shortly as the Phoenix will fly by. And they're going to be flying back out into the center of the map. So, Phoenix. With some good damage uh, done up until now. Going to struggle to get much more done. We're going to be seeing Deer is looking as though he's going to go aggressive. Now, he isn't going to have charge for this fight. He will be ahead on plus two, though, so that could be nice for him. But he does have quite a few zealots without charge. It's kind of kind of difficult to make work. I wonder if he forgot charge until, like, just now, because he's obviously had quite a while where he could have started up before this point. Let's see what's going to happen. And so do you have the... Army of Trap just continue to gather together. Phoenix picking off a couple of reinforcements as they come. I mean, this is probably the best choice for these Phoenix. You know, if they fight this main army, Archon Stalkers make pretty short work of them. They're actually going to find the Warp Prison. I mean, that's a huge pickoff right here. 200 minerals gone, and also just the fact that you have to rebuild that before you can send it across the map, so that really hurts. That really hurts. The Stalkers blink up. A Zealot will go down. Still just Deer poking around. See what he can do. The Phoenix... Taking more damage from those Archons. Archon able to push them away, but still, you know, trap doing what he can with that. And all of this buys him just that little bit more time. And again, without a pylon to reinforce here, this army cannot possibly fight from Deer. As he starts to back away, he is just playing without Immortals as well. So, that Immortalist style, rather very reliant on the Zart camp, very reliant on the Archons and being able to swarm in a little bit. Two Archons load up, starting to come down to the bottom. The extra gateway is about to finish up, plus two attack. Finishing shortly on the forge. Plus three, starting up on this forge as well. So Corona Goose in there. We'll prism into the main base. The extra Zealots warping in. All this looking good as we're going to be seeing the Zealots starting to drop down. Dio for big warping into the main base. Now starting to press at the front as well. 
There's any zealots here actually from Trap. The few that are here are all blocked in the back, but he does have shield batteries, so that's going to make up a little bit of that difference. Now that it's Immortals in the back firing away, that helps a lot as well. It's a bit of a weird scenario in the sense that uh, obviously these kind of stalkers can kind of blink in to help target fire down. And Deer just has more Archons, and Deer is breaking through on the right hand side. Third base is falling, and it looks as though Newbie are going to guarantee themselves a win in the first game, the first series of the China Team Championship Season 2. Newbie and Deer. There it is, 4 0. Doesn't even come to 6. Obviously, the series is decided at a 4 0. Newbie will already take it down. So this series is just for points. Obviously, every game is played up until six maps are pl played. Um, but obviously, Newbie are absolutely going to take this one down. So, hashtag go Newbie. By the way, thank you so much. Cy uh, Cypherx, who came in for the Twitch Prime sub about half an hour ago. Sorry, I missed it. Came in at a bad time, apparently. Thank you for... Uh... Thank you for the... Uh... Twitch Prime, much appreciated. Alright, so... As we get this going, we see what's going to happen. This uh, rolling now. I believe Terran. Our Reaper in the bottom. A lot of setup here. As we get this uh, ready to roll. So, uh, yeah, continue to build up. A couple of Reapers continue to run around. Command Center is on the way on the natural as well. Game TVT sets up with both players just getting the expansion out at the same time. So, getting this set up, getting this rolling. We're going to see what's going to happen in the next few moments. So, wouldn't mind at the front here from time as the build up continues. Cyclone on the way out, about to finish up in a moment or two. And just going to see the couple extra Marines on the way out as well. Starport about to finish from Cure. So, that's going to pop up, stop or dunk, and jump up, drop over to the tech lab instead. Factory going to build a tech lab, and a couple more marines on the way out as units just gather up at the front of this command center. So they're just going to gather up in the front. Again, there is the tech lab from Times. On Times, their factory finishing up. The two Reapers and the Hellions are sitting there as well. There's a wooden mine underneath the Hellion, so really nice bait. It's also just so if Cure kind of does press forward, he won't be able to see that Widow Mine because the Hellion's positioned on top of it. So it's very difficult for him to identify that that's there. But both players are playing pretty passively, so it doesn't really matter too much. Time going to invest into the early cloak Banshees. Time was the second best Chinese player in the China Team Championship Season 1 with a 42% win ratio when 6 and 7 in matches. Uh, that's not right. How can you go 6 and 7? Oh, I guess in the playoffs, right? Um, compared to Ayasoni, who was the first place, sorry, he went five and seven in matches. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, Ayasoni went six and eight, basically. So, time just—they uh, had the same kind of map difference. Ayasoni just had, you know, a couple more matches played, 43% win rate for him. So yeah, that's pretty. Uh, it was pretty cool for time. Definitely had a successful first season. Definitely pulling his weight on newbie, and definitely was a big part of newbie being able to make it to the. Playoffs, obviously newbie as well. They only play with the one Korean player, so it really is important that you know Time and Scarlet pull their weight because it means you know they're absolutely having to you know get some foreigner versus Korean wins on the board each week if they want to make those playoffs. So here comes the Banshee play. Now there's going to be Banshee split in two directions. So this is looking to try and just say, okay, well you might have Ravens out, but are they all in the right places at the right times? Well, the answer is at the moment none of them are in the right places. 
And these could absolutely deal damage as Cure pushes onto the map. He's going to have nothing at home. A couple of Vikings, but how are they going to defend against Cloak Banshees? Damage starts being done by Banshee number one in the natural. The Ravens start pulling back already. A good few SCVs going down in Marine as well. SCVs pull out of the main base to the natural expansion too. And the Banshees are very safe and just pulling away and not over committing in. This Banshee needs to pull back already though because the Raven is on the way over as well. It's going to fly top left, comes back in. There's the Raven. Uh, that was a bit of a shame from time. I mean, this Banshee should have pulled away, especially when he took such good care of the first Banshee. Was just expecting something a little bit better there. Uh, but that obviously didn't quite work out. Banshee flying back through the center of the map. Scan into the natural expansion again. Tank, couple Vikings, Raven flying around a little bit. So we're going to be seeing the uh, Rippers, Hellion, Marines, tanks all on the way up there for a moment. So all of this continuing to build as we are going to be seeing Cure pressing down into the center of the map. 1-1 one, one upgrade, stim pack on the way out as well. So getting that ready to go here time. He's trying to move into that bio play. Now he is going to have to play defensive here against this push of Cure. And he's going to have less Raven energy than his opponent. So that immediately does become a bit of a problem. He also doesn't have air control in the form of the Vikings. So it's a tough defense. How is time going to pull this off? Well, he will get started to get his tank sieged. Yeah, it's difficult without the Raven energy advantage. He's got a good amount of Marines on. He uses that to his advantage right now. Trying to push this back. Using his siege tank line to hold the space at the moment. Good line goes off. A little bit more damage done there. Tank's going to siege up. We are going to be seeing Interference Matrix dropped. Matrix dropped on the tanks of time as well. They're just going to be frozen. Are they like just starting to siege? I think they're just starting the siege, and that's why they're frozen in position. Oh my god! What a catch that is! Wow, time just loses everything, and Cure's gonna take it down just like that. In the chat, and you can still enter the prediction contest. All you have to do is fill out the list. You don't even have to fill out all of them for the entire week. You can just fill out the one for this series that's coming up. And uh, you can win prizes that involve core commanders and stuff and so on. Uh, the best prediction for each series is going to win a prize. So that's obviously pretty pretty awesome for you guys. Hopefully you think you agree. And uh, yeah. Do check it out. Just trying to make the Discord server a little bit more active and stuff. What's up Pooh Garden? Says thanks for casting these games. No worries. Hope you're doing well. and join them. Just going to be seeing the uh, SCVs then continuing to pop on up for the moment. Rax, gas, on the way out. Slowing this up and seeing where this is going to go. So yeah, you guys probably you know, have basically the length of this game to enter the predictions for our second series of the day. And then, of course, we still have predictions open to, you know, for tomorrow's games, for Tuesday's games. So make sure you check all of that out. Again, China Team Championship three days a week for the next five weeks. A bunch of broadcast hours. Hopefully, again, you guys are going to enjoy it. Should be, uh, should be a lot of fun. Should be awesome. We've on the way out here from time, getting this ready to go. Factory. Dropping down in the main base as well. There's the barracks. Uh, sorry, the depot just coming down to block the kind of Reaper jump up spot. It's obviously nice to try and shut down any possible proxy to Rax openers. Again, Cure can't win this series for Jyn but you can definitely try and redeem a little bit of their uh, pride here by picking up a, uh, a win. So if he's just continuing to mine away in that main base, the Reaper from Cure. Coming around out the top, and I'm yeah, just going to be seeing reproduction continuing from both. Factories are factories just a little later here from time, but he will go straight into a Hellion. And again, both of them have gone into a second Reaper, at least at the moment as well. They have been both pulling out of gas, so Command Center has dropped dead, and they're pretty much doing what we saw last game. The similar setup from the both of them here, where they both go in towards the Command Center after a kind of a factory based opening. Pretty fast command center after that and then going from there. And time is going to do the same thing where he's once again going to open with that widow mine. So again, that's set up and ready to roll. 
Infinity Reapers and the Hellion joined up together here from the time. Just going to be sat out the front as we do see the Cyclone on the way up from Kira as well in the main base. Getting that Cyclone to come and join in play. Commands then starting on each side of the map on the natural. So getting that ready to roll again. Widowmine going to burrow at the front here too. And Time's just going to do the same little trick where he's just going to park the Hellion right over that Widowmine. Really make it difficult to see and really try and bait Q on top of it if Kua ends up being aggressive. Obviously, there is a huge potential where Kua just sits back at home and says, Nope, I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to relax. And, you know, if you want to make something happen, you're going to have to come to me. Command Center finishing up on the natural from both players. Orbals will morph in. This time, time will not go cloak Banshees. Change it in towards the more typical Raven. And this is pretty much the guys just going mirrored build orders against each other with some very slight differences along the way. You know, things like the Widow Mine rather than another Hellion, etc. The Cyclone came up pretty fast from QA. Couple of differences, but yeah, nothing too crazy by a long stretch of the imagination. As this barracks lifts up, he's just going to go to a tech lab, start to up nice and quick. The extra barracks are just going straight towards reactors. We are here on Winter's Gate. First time we've seen this in the China Team Championship. Has these inhibitor zones placed around the map. Honestly, I like this map a lot more than I like Turbo Cruise. I feel like it does the inhibitor zone thing a lot better. And honestly, it's a pretty, it's a pretty nice map for just expanding up on once you kind of uh, get going into the next, you know, later stages. So you can definitely get behind this one. I'm glad to see it. I feel like if they picked an inhibitor zone map, I'm really glad it was this one to join this season of the ladder map pool rather than sticking with Turbo Cruise or some of the others that were seen in the Team Liquid Map Contest tournament when we casted that with these maps in it. Starport moves over to the side, starts a reactor. Again, barracks are on those reactors already, so it really is going to be a very high marine count very quickly here from time. Now that has given up certain things. Both of them only went for a single Raven, but it means Kira is already pumping out double Viking production. Even just got a Liberator here to help harass. So that's pretty crazy as the plus one attack upgrade coming in from time as well. And on the left side, the Liberator just coming around to see what's going on. Just trying to see what will... Uh happen here over the next few moments as the Liberator heads in towards the main base. So Liberator Siege is up already, some good damage being done. Time a little slow to respond, honestly. SCVs take a bit of a while to get out of there as well, even once he pulls them away. Five workers fall already. Make that six as one more spawns. Cyclone runs into Liberation Zone. Oh my god. He sent the Cyclone to deal with it, and now it's just being killed. This is a huge disaster. Marine will stim, and... Well, the big problem is, again, the air control is there for Cure. Time is going to have a tough little defense here. Cure is just winning these games out in the very early stages. Marine is able to shoot down the Liberator, and again, a couple tanks just kind of going to try and hold the front. They're going to siege pull back. Cyclone locks onto one of them. He's doing a lot of damage already. The Marines going to sim forwards, and it's all a turret mayhem on both sides of the map. The Marines here, though, will start to break out. A couple of tanks that were in siege definitely costing a little bit. Vikings are going to land to try and help buff out the front line, and there's still going to be one tank surviving here from Cure with the Vikings to go along with it, and it looks as though, I mean, these Vikings can just sit and pick away at supply depots, etc. Time going to take more damage from this. The tank will siege up a bit further forwards, and, well, time isn't even close again. The siege tank on the map. Kira's just had slightly better builds, slightly better setups in these openings and has worked wonders with it as now we're going to be seeing, I mean, SCV's just getting blown up all over the place. Yeah, sure, that you know, he's picking up a tank, he's picking up some Vikings, but 19 workers go down. Time is down, 30 workers coming out of this. Again, he chose to go into the faster bio units and that does make him weak to these 1-1-1 focused attacks. And you could see the problem, you know, he just didn't have the Viking count, he didn't really have the air control. He loses the siege tank in that medevac, and the attempt to drop to get back into this is going to end right here and now. Kyo takes the game.